Okay, well basically, like I started off a moment ago, to pique your interest, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to the end of the talk and tell you what I do when I go to court. The very first thing I do with the court, before I even enter the court, I suspend the judge. The judge may not make any decisions whatsoever. He cannot make a decision against me. He cannot make a decision for me. If he makes a decision against me, I'll issue a court order vacating his decision. If he makes a decision for me, I'll issue a court order vacating his decision. If I like the decision, I'll issue another order granting it. But I do not let the judge make any decisions at all, not one, okay? Not on his own. There is one case, and that case is on this CD, where the judge didn't get the message. And he issued a second decision after I had vacated his first decision. And by the way, when I vacate a decision, I don't just do like judges do and issue orders. What I do is I have an introduction to the order, which is a small course in, in law for the judge to read. I don't care about the attorneys. It's written for the judge. It's written on his level, and it educates him as to why it is that I'm number one and he's number two. Then I give him the order. Okay, he gets it as a package. Now, there was one judge who didn't get the message. So what I did was I fined him for contempt of court. Okay? <laughs> the Founding Fathers really understood abuse of power. They had it up to their eyeballs with Mr. King. The old King George up there, he really was having a good time with all his uh, military coming over and harassing us, killing our people, raping them, robbing them, and not getting convicted, not punishing his soldiers. We had it. I mean, and if you want to understand the situation, just go back and read the Declaration of Independence. That's a wonderful statement of what the problem was about and why we reacted to King George. We didn't want to leave the king. We were very loyal as a people. But there were the abuses. The Founding Fathers understood this. Well, they didn't really understand it. They first tried the uh, Confederacy. That didn't really work so well. So the Constitution was a second attempt at it. Now, in my opinion, the Constitution is one of the finest documents ever created, but it's being ignored. You see problems around you today, in my opinion, they're not because of the Constitution, they're because the Constitution is being ignored. And why is it being ignored? Because ignorance is rampant now. They do not teach civics in school anymore. The very first school that was mandatory, public school, the very first mandatory public school was populated under military supervision. The children were escorted to the school against the parents' wishes by the military. Not the police, but the military. Now, why was it so important for the federal government or whatever government was that brought the soldiers out, why was it so important for them to go to that extreme, which basically was illegal, unconstitutional? Well, because the key to population control is mindset, and they had to get them in. From the 1850s to the 1950s, they gradually stripped out the subject of civics and replaced it with a new subject called American government. Has anybody seen that in school? Okay, what's the difference? Civics, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says something to the effect that is that branch of political philosophy that concerns personal rights. It does not concern government, it concerns personal rights. They quit teaching that. Now I want you to understand, when the Constitution was formed, or actually when we declared our independence in 1776, we were not an uncultured, boorish bunch of people. We were not a bunch of backwoodsmen. That's what they like to tell us. They like to leave us with the impression that, uh, you know, we're just a bunch of random people that decided to rebel. Just to put it in perspective, I want you to realize that in 1776, Harvard University was over 100 years old. Okay? We were 
a cultured society. We had our customs, we had our usages, we were equal to England in terms of our development. They like to tell us that the United States is over 200 years old. Well, when you talk of the culture here, we're over 400 years old. We were established. And out of those experiences, we developed the Constitution. Who, are, who do I mean by we? I mean we the people. Okay? On this CD, this CD is law notes. And that's just what it is. This is not a complete CD. It just has some notes that I've accumulated over time. On the cover page here, you'll see there's law notes and there's the example. The law notes, that's the theory. The example is an actual case where the theory got applied. Okay? So this case involved an automobile going through a stop sign and injuring a rider on a bicycle. And it resulted in $50,000 or $75,000 in surgery, plus a lot of ongoing treatments. Interesting feature of the vehicle code, and that is that if the driver is a minor and has a driver's license uh, with the okay of the parents, then any accident that that minor gets into, the liability is limited to $15,000. Who do you think pays the rest? The victim. It also says that the parents are limited to 15,000 liability. And on top of that, the aggregate total of the liability of both the child and the parent is $15,000. So the bottom line is $15,000, that's your limit. Victim pays the rest. That's how the statutory system seems to work. Well, this is common law. Under common law, we have a little different approach. Under common law, we look at this and we say, well, one of the principles of common law is there shall not be no remedy. There must be a remedy for an, every injury. So if there isn't a remedy, we can make up a remedy. Okay? That's one of the principles. Also, it's, a, it's an established principle in case law that the state of California, or any government, is not responsible for what happens among the people, okay, or the citizens. They're not really responsible as long as they just pass the rules but don't participate, okay? So the legislature makes up the rules, we call them statutes and codes, but they're not responsible, they hold no liability for those rules. Okay, each and every citizen is responsible for his own behavior Okay, and uh, the state's not responsible. However, if the state jumps in and participates, then the state assumes the liability. Well, take a look at this. Here's the vehicle code, that's a set of rules, fine. Now, do we have driver education programs? Do we have quality control experts out there called traffic cops? Okay. Do we have a number of administrative things? So what we said is, well, plus we have one more factor, and that is that this individual called the state of California is a third-party intervener. We don't care how much the uh, child and parent are protected by the third-party intervener if the third-party intervener is willing to cover the costs, cover the, the liability, right? It's only fair. I mean, your common gut feel tells you that's fair. So that's what the common law is all about. Common law is common sense. It really is. What is common law? It's public opinion. What do all of you think? What would you think if you were on a jury in a common law case before you and somebody said apply common sense? That would make sense. So that's what we sued them on. This case is ongoing. We have yet to write the final judgment. We're almost there. Actually, we are there, we just have to write it. So what you have here is everything except the final judgment, but you don't need the final judgment because all the principles are on this CD. I'd like to point out something else. Many years ago, there was a fellow named Cicero, and this is on the CD, I just, I'm not gonna hunt for it right now, but it's on there. Cicero said that a few men live by reason 
Most live by experience. The remainder live by necessity. And the animals live by nature. Now what he's saying here, let's start at the top. Most men, I mean a few men, live by reason. What this means is that you look at something. Here's A, here's B, and out of the A and B you conclude this is C. Okay? You hear a noise on the roof and you conclude without looking out the window that it's raining. Okay? You draw your conclusions from the facts that are before you. This approach that I'm using requires you to think. Don't ask me for an example. I already gave you one. It's called example. So when you go looking through this stuff, you're going to have to be on top of it. There's a real simple rule of law that sometimes we forget. And what it is, it's actually a maxim of law. And what it says is that the law does not protect he who slumbers on his rights. Okay? The law is not going to go out and see if you're in trouble and protect you. Now, if you don't have the intellectual power, then you're considered to be one of those who's slumbering on his rights. The law won't protect a person who's dumb. So, you'll have to, I don't know who's smart and who's dumb, but I'll tell you this. If you use this approach, you're going to have to be on top of it. You're going to have to be able to reason your way through because if you don't apply your reasoning powers, then it won't work. They'll pull a quickie on you and you won't figure it out. The very first time I ever issued a court order was really interesting. The guy was in jail and he asked me to help out and I was just fresh studying this stuff. But I had formed some ideas. So, he understood sovereignty and he, had, he was careful to guard his position. So the municipal court had him and in jail and so he moved for habeas corpus in the superior court. Superior court rubber stamped a no on it. So he made a second motion for habeas corpus. They said no again. So then what he did, he, that, it was after that that I got involved. And he said, um, he understood the sovereignty. So what we talked about it, and what we had him do is appoint me as a special master in his court. Now, a special master has any power that the sovereign will allocate to him. There's no limit on a, on a magistrate, or a special master, I mean, if the sovereign grants it to him. So in this case, he granted me the power to take depositions to investigate and do a whole bunch of other stuff and to hold hearings, okay? So while I was working on the case, we heard a rumor, jailhouse rumor, that they were going to bring his case up on the following Monday. So that Monday, I dressed up like an attorney. I had a pinstripe suit and tie. I looked very much like an attorney. And I got there early and I managed to wangle an audience with the judge went into the judge's chambers, and I said to the judge, I said, I've been appointed as a special master in the Superior Court, and by the way, I had it filed and I had a certified copy in my hand. And, uh, and, and the appointment, by the way, was made by the sovereign himself, the guy who had moved for habeas corpus, because it was his court, see? And I'll explain that in a few minutes. So he appointed me, uh, I mean, he, he listened to me a moment, and I said, the reason I'm here I'm not here to discuss the case. I don't want to impose on you in that way. I was very polite to him. But I said, there's some unusual things that are happening here, and I just wanted to give you, you know, an up, a heads up on it, letting you know that I'm here to conduct business, not to stir up anything. Okay? So I said, great. He appreciated that. Let me tell you something. These, these judges, some of them are really human. Okay? I had a little luck. It's, as I found out later, he was much smarter than most judges. I didn't know it at the time, but it turned out this guy was really pretty sharp for a municipal court judge. But um, anyway, as I was talking to him, the prosecutor came in. He took one glance at me, obviously a fellow attorney, and so he started talking to the judge. And lo and behold, he's going to talk about the very same case I'm in. 
Now you know that an attorney is not supposed to go in without the other party, right? So here I had him cold. <laughs> now it was okay for me to be there because I was not representing him. I was an officer of the court, the superior court. And besides, I wasn't discussing the case anyway. I was just letting him know that I, would, I had a purpose. Well, the judge was pretty sharp. He, he cut that off real quick. <laughs> of course, if I wanted to push the issue, it was too late for the guy. But I let him off the hook. But we got out. When he called the case in the courtroom, I stood up and I had on my right the public defender that had been appointed to the case. And on my left, I had the, the district attorney. And at some opportune moment, I got a chance to speak. I was standing right between them. So the judge says to me, uh, we talked back and forth. He, he wants to know what's happening here. And I said, well, I said, I said I'm from the, uh, I've been appointed as a special master in the Superior Court of the State of California. And I am here today to observe the proceedings in this master. And I'm here and now declaring the Superior Court of the State of California open and in session. So now we had one courtroom and two courts. And so then we started discussing it. And I said to the judge, I said, uh, there were some uh, issues here uh, involving common law and uh, so on. And I said, and so he told me, he says, well, he says, you know, he says the common law doesn't have any standing in this court. And I said to him, I said, I agree. However, the Miranda decision, Miranda versus Arizona, says that where uh, substantive rights are concerned, there shall be no rulemaking. That wasn't quite correct, it, it's, but close enough. So he acknowledged that. He said, OK, yeah, he, he respected the Miranda decision. So then uh, he says, well, what do you want from me? Now, that was a trap, because I don't want anything from him. But my court does, my sovereign does. So it's very important that I didn't say what I wanted. Instead, I represented the court. So I said to him, it is the wish of the Superior Court that the Municipal Court release jurisdiction of this matter to the Superior Court until such time as the issues in the Superior Court are settled. Okay? And so he said, I'll do that if you will give me the order in writing. So I said, well, I came here, now I can speak for myself, see? I said, I came here with an order half prepared because I didn't know exactly how things would go, but I said, if you will recess the case, I'll complete the order and deliver it to you upon recall. So he said, great. So he recessed the case, moved on to other business. In the meantime, I went out and I, hand printed the rest of it and did the copy machine thing. You know, it was quite a, quite a race there because I wanted to be back soon. So I got back there and he, he recalled the case. Now before I go into what happened, I'd like to tell you something else that happened in that case. In that first session, we had a moment where we were both collecting our thoughts, the judge and I. The district attorney stood up and she said, Your Honor, who is this man? <laughs> I don't know who he is. I don't know what he's doing here. Silence. The judge just sat there and looked at her. She sat down. And then he turned back to me and he picked up on our conversation as though she was not in the room. Now, you know how cozy district attorneys and judges are. Was that an insult or what? Now, there I was with my knees shaken because, you see, I was operating on reason. I had no experience to look to. I couldn't ask anybody what happens, blah, 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 okay? It was pure, raw reason. But my research told me I was right. But my knees were shaken, believe me. I was scared because I, I knew I was kind of out on the you know, <laughs> on the plank on this one. So anyway, when that happened, I instantly knew I was on the right track because no way would any judge ever treat a district attorney that way. No way would he give a third party intervener such as myself the amount of time he gave. 
right? You know that, but he did here. So I was doing something right. So anyway, back to the second session. I delivered the order to him, he read it into the record, and then he ordered it to be filed in the record, and then he closed the case for that moment, and that was it, okay? He accepted the order. Now I'm sure he was gonna do some research and decide whether or not to arrest me and so on. You know, but at, at, as it turned out, it worked. And now, what I'm telling you here doesn't always work. Gandhi made it clear that passive resistance works extremely well. He beat England with passive resistance. Using passive resistance, he liberated all of India from England. We have the same thing here. These techniques, we've been pretty successful at stopping the government. We have not been successful at getting the government to pay. Why? Because passive resistance works for the government too. They say, make us. Okay, pretty hard to make it. So what you have to do is when you, when you do these things, you have to put their paychecks at risk. That's when you get their attention. Okay? As long as they're secure in their paychecks, and you know how bureaucrats are, they're all insecure. You know, they, the bureaucrats uh, don't like to take risks. They're, they're non-risk takers. And when you start suing them and including them in it and making a reasonable lawsuit to where it looks like, hmm, I might lose this one, all of a sudden their attitudes change. Also, another thing that is really, really important is attitude, okay? Attitude is one of the key things. I do not buy into the concept that the government is evil. What I do buy into is that there's a lot of abusers in government. And what I, my own experience has been that if you do your paperwork right, and of course if you have a high enough risk assessment on their paychecks, there are a lot of people in government who will back you up if you give them the tools to work with. There are a lot of people who don't agree with what the government's doing who are in government, but they're not gonna put their jobs at risk. They will put their jobs ahead of your liberty. So you've gotta give them the tools with which to protect you, because they're not gonna do it on their own. And so we've had a number of turnarounds where the judge, who was a real tiger on the bench, suddenly became a lamb and sweet as pie. Why? Wasn't anything that we directly said as far as we knew, and yet he did a 180. Well, I know a leopard doesn't change his spots. Isn't that the old story? So what happened? Well, what happened, and I'm theorizing because I don't know, but my theory is, is that we must have got him boxed in and somebody, one of his perhaps wiser colleagues told him, you better quiesce this thing or you might get in trouble. See, that's what I can figure. That's what must have been happened. Or they might have just told him it was flat out wrong. So all I know is that I select my target, I select my strategy, I go straight toward it as best I can, and I trust that there are honest people behind the scenes who I will never meet, never know about, but who will back me up if they can do so without risk. And how do they do it without risk? They look at the paperwork and the paperwork's solid and they let the guy know, hey, this is solid. Watch out, these guys might get you. You better get rid of this as fast as you can, okay? That to me, and I count that as a win, even if I didn't collect any money. So anyway, that's my little two cents worth of philosophy on that subject. Well, like I said, I can't cover in great detail everything, but I'm just going to skim along and introduce you to some ideas which I think you'll like. Let's go to the law notes. Oh, well, before that, I want to tell you about the devil and Daniel Webster. This is a great little story written in uh, 1936, I think it was. And the reason I put this story in here is because Daniel Webster was an attorney, among other things. The real Daniel Webster. This is a fictional story. It's a great little short story. First appeared in the Saturday Evening Post in 1936. What I like about it is it is the common law in action. And there's the accuser, 
The magistrate came in. The jury was there. It was a jury of all Americans. I think uh, what the pirate teach was on there and a few other interesting guys. They were all picked by the devil, okay, because it was his court, because he was the accuser. But uh, this, it's such a neat little story, and it has some very, very wise advice. By example, it has some wise advice on how to deal with a jury. So, entertaining story. I think everybody should read it, and so that's why I put it in. If you want to send me any email, click on the email contents, comments, and that will bring up the, the email. A little footnote here, totally unrelated to this, but time for some entertainment. I was over at a labor union the other day in their offices, and I saw a bumper stick on somebody's desk. It said, get that son of a bush. <laughs> no, it said get rid of him, that's what it said, okay. Anyway, <clears throat> we'll go to the law notes. Now the law notes, we have an overview, which is just a few words that are nice, but they don't mean much. Um, we have the foundation right here, and the rest of it is supportive of the foundation, but the foundation is the most important part. If you're going to read this CD, I suggest that first chance you get, you read everything that's in the foundation, because that gives you the foundation on this strategy that I use. So let's take a quick spin through the foundation. The first thing is languages, language and dictionaries. You remember 1984, that story? Here's a little quote from it. How's the dictionary getting on, Winston asked his comrade. We're getting the language into its final shape, Syme answered. By the year 2050, at the very latest, not a single human being will be alive who could understand the conversation we're having now. Okay, this is what they're doing. They're changing the, the language for us. If you look at the Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition, I like that dictionary. The reason I like it is because it tells me what their policies are. It's not a very good legal dictionary, but it sure tells me what their policies are. I like to know what the attorneys are thinking. Same thing with the sixth, seventh, and I think the eighth is now, is now out. That's policy. That's what they want. They're telling the attorneys what they want the attorneys to know. The fourth edition and earlier has real law in it, common law. Okay? But they're stripping out the common law. And they want to go purely to statutory law. Well, good reason. Uh, statutory law is the law of the special interests. Common law is the law of the people. They don't want that. So the statutory law is being modified through education, or lack of it, rather than an honest argument in the legislature and so forth. And one in particular has to do with what a court of record is. And there are five factors that define a court of record in Black's Law Dictionary, fourth edition. They're all listed in Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition. They took out three of them. Okay, we'll get into that in a moment. But language is very important. In America, we speak three languages. Every one of us speaks three languages, okay? All three are called English. So they don't make us aware of these, them as, language, as separate languages, but they are. Now, the most unstable form of language, the one that changes from day to day, street to street, town to town, is called slang. That's English. Now. Just think of the tough time foreigners have here. You have a, a foreigner with you, okay? He's listening to what you say. You walk in, there's a, there's a party. You don't know what's going on, so you say, hey, what's coming off? Going on, coming off, means the same thing in slang, right? So, a foreigner who doesn't know the idioms, the slang, is in trouble. So in order to communicate with foreigners, and also a foreigner means even somebody from a different city or a different culture, whatever, we have another language we call formal English. That's the language that comes out of the book. We learn it in school, and we learn to talk about that, and that language is a lot more stable. It takes 50 years or 100 years to change the meaning of a word, and even then it's still fairly stable. But there are differences. Have any of you ever studied the meaning of resident? 
Okay? The word resident, as it's used on the streets and in formal English, doesn't mean what it means in the courtroom. Okay? And that's the, where the third language is spoken, courtroom English. You absolutely must study each language separately as if it were a separate language. Do not assume when you are studying law that you know what those words mean. What I did when I started reading the Constitution, I had the law dictionary right next to me. And every word that was used the first time in the Constitution, I looked it up. Boy, did I get some surprises. So you look up these words, you learn these languages, and you'll find out, and the most obvious example is the word resident. In ordinary language, resident means this is where you live, this is your, your home, this is where you, you are, right? By right. But the legal meaning of resident means that you're a foreigner, you're here for a specific purpose, and when you complete that purpose, you will leave, you will go home, back across the border, wherever you came from. Okay? Are you a resident of California? That means you came from outside of California. What, where did you come from if you came from outside of California? Well, to find that out, I always ask the person, are you a citizen of the United States? He says, yes, I know he came from the District of Columbia. Okay? That's his real home. So, the legal meaning is important, so be careful how you use words. I hear people throwing words around. I hear them using phrases carelessly. How about without prejudice? Have you ever seen somebody create an affidavit and at the bottom sign it without prejudice? I bet a lot of you have. I know I've seen it quite a bit. What does without prejudice mean? It means you're reserving all your rights and you really didn't mean anything by this. This is not a commitment to tell the truth, even though you called it an affidavit. That's what it means in legal language. So, I'm just alerting you, without getting into too much detail, that there are three languages in America, and be aware of it, and be sure you're speaking the right language when you go to court. Okay, let's get right into the first thing. People or citizen, which one are you? You better be a people if you want to use this technique. If you're a citizen, believe me, you're going to get hurt. Okay, so you better be a people. You, and you better understand what it is. Well, <clears throat> there's no real definition of people. I cannot honestly tell you what a people is. By the word, the word by the way, the word people can be either plural or singular. Okay? So it is correct English to say you are a people. I am a people or all of us together are people. Plural or singular is correct. So, I don't have a definition that I can draw on of what a people is. But what I can do is I can define the relationship between people and government. Whatever a people is, I know it's above government and outranks government. Let's look at the preamble. You see, before the United States uh, was formed, there was no government. Yeah, we had King George as our leader, and we were his subjects. But two things happened that were significant. One of the things that happened was that we rejected King George, Declaration of Independence. The second thing that happened was King George canceled the charters. Nothing. We were a free people then, both from our point of view and from England's point of view. It was really a mistake, on, on, legally speaking, on King George's part. So there's no precedent. We were all literally sovereigns, but we were not ignorant sovereigns. Like I told you, Harvard University was over 100 years old at the time of the American Revolution. We were a culture, and we had a way of knowing. Did you know that before the American Revolution, the English booksellers sold more law books to the Americans than they did to the people in England, or the subjects in England. We were all lawyers. In fact, an admiral wrote back to the king saying he couldn't enforce the king's laws because everybody in America is a lawyer. 
Lawyer means know the law. Okay, not a not an attorney who represents somebody. He says they all know the law. And he said, by night they're destroying the king's properties, and by day they were sitting on the grand juries and blocking us from prosecuting. Okay, well, it was a problem for the king's men. So, but you see, later, we were still lawyers, but we were all now sovereign. Every one of us, there was no higher law. So they did a little experiment. The states themselves, understand this, not the people, but the states themselves organized themselves and they came up with this confederation of states, okay? And that didn't work out so well, apparently, so they sent a bunch of representatives to fix things, and the representatives apparently took a new tack, and instead of representing the, the states like they were sent to do, they declared themselves to be people. And using their own sovereignty, which they had all along, they uh, created a new entity called the uh, Constitution for the United States of America. And so then they said, look, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you will find what I'm telling you at the end of the Constitution in the last couple of paragraphs. But basically what they said is, look, we created this thing, but we're not going to put the Constitution into effect unless at least nine of you states agree to it. Well, they got the nine to agree to it, one way or another, but those were states. Understand, that wasn't people. The people created the Constitution. The states decided to join in as separate entities. So now we have ten entities, right? The states were nine of them, and the people were the tenth one. So now we have this Constitution, and there have been court cases that, that recognize that the Constitution is a document of the people and not a document of the states. It was created by the people. Okay? So... I know that there's a lot of stuff you've probably heard about. Uh, for example, we're all subjects of the Queen of England now. Anybody heard that one? So there's been a lot of these theories. I'm sure you've heard people say, well, there's a big scam going on. Well, I'll tell you what. I think they're right. But I don't pay any attention to it, even though I think they're right. Why? Because... When I walk into court, the only thing that means anything when I'm in court is what comes up on top of the table. And if we are under the Queen of England, they better put it on the table, otherwise it won't work. Okay? It doesn't matter what the lie is if they don't bring it out. So I pretend, because I don't know everything, I just move ahead, I pretend. We've got a constitution, we've got the statutes, we've got the codes, we've got the rules of court. I presume that they're all there, and I move forward as if they were real. And there has not yet been one judge or prosecutor who's had, or defense attorney who has had the guts to say, wait a minute, we have a scam working against you and you can't do that. Okay? They have, they may have a commitment to that hidden system, but they also have a commitment to try and fool me. They can't let that secret out. So I just go on ahead and exercise it, and it seems to work. So I just don't worry about all these complicated theories. Also, I don't worry about uh, what the specific statutes are in this type of thing, unless I'm applying it to them, then I do worry. But it doesn't apply to me because I'm in my sovereign capacity. And we'll get into that. But here's where it comes from. You look at the preamble, okay? And in the preamble, it says, We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic, and you've got a laundry list of tasks here, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Well, if we have a Constitution, I'm going to take the Constitution at face value in the courts, okay? And this is legal language now. This is not formal English. This is not slang. This is legal English we're looking at here. So it says we the people. Does it say what the people are? No. So I can't tell you what the people are. But it also says where we're from. We're from the United States. To me that means the states that are united. We're from there. Doesn't mean I'm subject. It just means I'm from there. And in order to do this laundry list of tasks, 
we the people ordain and establish this Constitution for whom? Not for you, not for me, but for them, the United States of America. The United States is two words, the United States of America is four words. The United States is the states united. The United States of America is that 10 mile square plot of land called the District of Columbia and all the properties that they may have own wherever they may be. That's the United States of America. The United States of America is a trust, a public trust, a public corporation. It is not a country. Technically, the United States of America is not a country. The states are countries. The states have governors. How can you tell the United States of America is not a country and that it's actually a corporation? It's real easy. All corporations have presidents and a secretary and a treasurer as a minimum. Does the United States of America have a president, secretary, and treasurer? Of course, because if you read the preamble, you will see that every single element is needed for a trust. You have the trustors, that's the people. You have the trustees, that's the United States of America. You have the task to be done by the trust, it lists them there. It has the authority by which it exists, it's ordained and established. That's everything you have in a trust. So it's a trust. All corporations are trusts. Whether it's a corporation for profit, a non-profit corporation, a trust that's actually called a trust, common law trust, for example, or Massachusetts trust, or if it's called the United States of America, it's still a trust. And so, there we have it there. Now, what did we the people do? Well, we ordained and established. What does, what's the legal meaning of ordain and establish? Ordain means to make law. It is by our sovereign authority that we people authorized the existence of the United States of America. And to establish means to actually write it on paper. We created the paperwork. So we have the authority and we have the actual document for them to read. So that is what establishes it. Okay? Now, again, I don't know what the people are, but I know what the relationship is. We, the people, are the authorizers. We decreed the law. And the law is that the United States of America shall exist, and we established it with the written document. So, even though I cannot tell you what people are, or what this people is, I can sure tell you my relationship with the United States of America. And the very line of logic, the reasoning that I gave you, also applies to the state constitutions. You read them, you'll see. It says in the preambles. You ask an attorney, what's the preamble, what's the significance in the Constitution? You say, oh, well, that's just an introductory thing. Well, actually, he's right if you subject yourself to the Constitution. But if you stay outside the Constitution, if you decree that you yourself are one of the people, then you're outside. It doesn't apply to you. Okay? And that's my assumption. That's what I do when I go to court. When I open up in court, when I open up a case, and I'll show you here. I'm going to go to that, I'm going to go to that example. First Amendment action, okay? Here it is, Superior Court of California, County of Calamity. Now, the first paragraph was necessary because this is an amended action and it replaced the f original action in its entirety. But the second paragraph would normally be the first paragraph. Look what it says. William Jones, here and after plaintiff, is one of the people of California and in this court of record complains of blah, blah, blah. Those two things, plaintiff and court of record, that's the key. You don't have to say you're sovereign. You don't have to say God's on your side. You don't have to say that you have higher authority, you don't need it. You are the higher authority, okay? 
The first part, being one of the people, that establishes your sovereignty. That's all you have to do is you say you're one of the people, that's it, you're now sovereign. And check this out. Who's accusing you of being one of the people? Yourself, right? You don't have to prove anything about yourself. The only time proof is needed is in when one person accuses another person. If somebody chooses to tell me I'm not one of the people, guess what? Now they have to provide the proof. The presumption is I am whatever I say I am. Okay? It's their responsibility as accusers is to prove I'm not one of the people. And if they try to put up some flaky contract, if they try to say, well, you have a social security number, you have a driver's license, blah, 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 I'll say, okay, how does that make me not one of the people? Because people are sovereign automatically, see, by that, if you have that label. How do you pull me out of that? It's their responsibility to prove, you understand that? Prove that I'm not one of the people. Okay, and if they say, they try to say, well, it's because of the contract, I'll say, well, where does it say that in the contract? And then they reach into some remote statute somewhere, let's say, and they find it and they say, well, this is it. Well, now you know under international law and local law and common law, every legal system there is, you know that for a valid contract, it has to be entered into knowingly, right, intelligently, right? And if the other party in the contract knows something that you don't know, and if he knows you don't know, and he fails to disclose it to you, that's fraud. And therefore the contract's no good anyway. So I don't worry about the fact that, by the way, I do have a social security number. By the way, I do have a driver's license, although it is signed without prejudice. I think some of you can appreciate that. Okay, without prejudice is the UCC 1-207, or under California UCC, it's 1207, uh, that reserves your rights. And so I reserve my rights. So they pull this on me, I say, well, wait a minute, you know. Yeah, that may be the contract manual, but where does it say that I've, you know, I'm beholden to you in all areas of society? And besides, I'm not engaged in commerce anyway. But that's another issue. Okay. So what I'm pointing out to you is that when you open up your, your lawsuit, you say you're one of the people and in this court of record. And I'm going to explain the court of record. And I, I've gone into a lot about this people because this is critical to the, to the strategy. You've got to understand that if you're a people, you are sovereign automatically. You are above the government because the government exists by my authority. That judge on the bench has no authority to overtake me unless I grant it to him. Okay? That's why I'm able to vacate his orders. That's one of the reasons. There's actually a couple more reasons. Okay, so going back to the principles, the theory, we go to the law notes. People are citizen. Which one are you? Now, I'm going to contrast this with being a citizen of the United States. Because I've explained the preamble, and now you understand that the preamble is the fork in the road. The preamble is where you choose. Are you going to go into the Constitution, under it, and accept its authority, or are you going to remain outside the Constitution as a, a, uh, one of the, the owners of the country? Okay? Do you own the country, or does the country own you? Well, I go in as one of the owners. Okay, so now we have the, let's go further down here. By the way, I explain right here the structure of the preamble, who the trustor is, the venue, the purpose, the beneficiary. So if you want to know more, read the CD. But uh, here's, here, there's some interesting things to back you up in terms of case law. Now understand one thing. You have a structure here. You have the people. Underneath the people, you have the Constitution. Under the Constitution, you have the legal system, okay, the statutes and the, and the codes, okay, and the admiralty law. The admiralty law draws its strength from this Constitution also. That's their authority to act. Then under that, you have the slaves. Some people call them citizens of the United States. 
Okay? So, but if you're one of the people, look what they said in New York in a case here that happened uh, 1829. The people of this state, as the successors of its former sovereign, are entitled to all the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative. You want to know what your rights are? Don't ask me. I don't, can't tell you. You are the only one who knows what your rights are. The Bill of Rights is not your resource. It's nice that there's some things listed in the Bill of Rights that I like, but those aren't my rights. My rights are whatever I, in my sovereign capacity, by my own prerogative, decide they are. Pretty powerful concept, isn't it? That's the key thing. Formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative. Okay? So, there's other supporting case law, but I thought that might cover it sufficiently. Now, what is sovereign? What does that mean, sovereign? Well, let's skip a little further down. There is a case which basically says that the very essence of sovereignty is that the sovereign makes law. Okay? If you want to prosecute somebody, you don't have to have a statute. All you have to do is say it's wrong, whatever their action is. Now, I have a personal hang-up as a sovereign, okay? I am really offended if anybody wears pink shoes in my presence. As a matter of fact, I'm so offended that I attach a death penalty to it, okay? I don't tolerate pink shoes. I hope none of you are wearing pink shoes now, because it's really a bad deal. Okay? Now, if somebody were wearing pink shoes, what I would do is I'd prosecute, of course. That's what kings do. Well, as it turns out, in our system of common law, you're entitled, as a defendant, to call in a jury. And what's the job of the jury? Well, the jury has two jobs. One job you always hear about, they judge the facts, right? Do the facts conflict with the law? They don't tell you the other one, and that is that it's your job to also judge the law. Now, what do you think the probability is that in my court I could gather together a jury that would support my anti-pink shoe law? Okay. Yeah, they're not really too good, and I happen to know that as a king, so I've been a little slow about enforcing that law. On the other hand, let's say somebody walks up to you and really gives you a black eye, really slugs you, okay, unprovoked, they just came out of nowhere and did it. And then you brought charges against them and you decreed in your lawmaking that A, it's wrong to poke somebody in the eye without provocation, and B, the penalty is 30 days in jail. What do you think the chances are that I could get a conviction from a jury? I'd say they'd be pretty high. In your gut, you know that's good law. So that's the beauty of the jury system, the custom and usage, and that's the protection for the defendant and the great leveler, the stabilizer in our common law. And they used it a lot during the early days of this country. And so we, the people, don't need statutes. We just need common sense. If you want to bring the Bible in, you want to quote a passage from the Bible, and you decree that this is the law of this case. That's fine. And by the way, that's what I do do. I have a section in my lawsuit. It always says the law of the case is. You know how it is when you appeal a case and they tell you that, well, if you didn't bring it up, then they cannot consider it? That's the law of the case. And they call it that, the law of the case. Well, where did that law of the case come from? Well, in the absence of anybody decreeing it, the judge is going to fool around and kind of bring it in, because after all, there's so much ignorance out there, he can get away with it. Nobody objects. But the law of the case is decreed by the sovereign. You're the plaintiff, you decree what the law is. And the word is decree, okay? You decree what the law is, and that becomes the law of the case. And I include a whole section in my lawsuits that is the law of the case. I think it's the 14th Amendment. Here we are. 
In the 14th Amendment, it says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. Of course, the excuse for having this 14th Amendment was so that the black slaves who had been freed could now have some standing, whereas there was no legitimate way for any slave to become a citizen of the state they were living in. The feds introduced this clause in order to, say, force the states to recognize that these black people who used to be slaves were now citizens of the United States. And if you're a citizen of the United States, you had to be recognized and you got all the benefits, privileges, whatever that you should get. That's the theory. Okay, well, actually this is a Trojan horse here because they wanted to include everybody, <laughs> okay? They want everybody to be a citizen of the United States, but they couldn't change the Constitution to pull in the white folks. So what they did is they changed the educational system. Again, we go back to about 1850 when they, they uh, created the first mandatory public school, but it wasn't until 1868 that we got the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment defined, you know, there's only one other place where a word is defined in the Constitution, and that's treason, okay? And now here we have a phrase, citizen of the United States, and it's specifically defined. Not everybody can be a citizen of the United States, or I should say not everybody is a citizen of the United States. For example, its requirement is you have to be born or naturalized. Well, if you're born or naturalized, that's easy. Most of us are. But it also says subject to the jurisdiction. Well, what if you're born or naturalized and not subject to the jurisdiction? Well, then you're not a citizen of the United States. You still belong here, but you're not a citizen of the United States. Who are you? Well, I can tell you who I am. I'm one of the people of the United States. Okay? So, are you a 14th Amendment citizen or are you a preamble people? Now, I do not accept the phrase sovereign citizen. Why? Because a sovereign is a master. A citizen is subject to the master. How can you be a master servant? That's why I reject the term. I never use it in my paperwork. In fact, I don't even say sovereign and I don't say citizen. I never use those terms. I stick with constitutional vocabulary. I say I'm a people. Let them challenge it if they dare. By the way, no one's ever challenged it. You know why? Probably because they don't understand the significance of it. They read through this, they go blah, 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 he's one of the people in the United States, yeah, 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 you know, and they read down, they get down to the meat of it, right? Well, I'll tell you something, being a people of the United States is what gives me the authority to, to bump off the judge, get him, legally speaking, off the bench. He's still there, I let him play the part. I actually assist him in scamming the opposing attorney, okay? You read the transcripts, that, sample, that example case is, has also the transcripts. You can see how the judge reacted. Check out how the judge talked before he found out he was number two, okay? And then compare that to how he talked in the court after he got the order, vacating his order. Big change in attitude. And my method is educate the judge, then when the judge wants to do something, he looks to me and he says, I think we should do such and such. And he says, is that okay? Or he says, or he just looks at me, and I say, yes, Your Honor, that sounds good. That's fine. What am I doing? He's not making the order. I'm authorizing him to make my order, okay? Then he turns to the attorney, and you know all attorneys are taught in law school that the judge is an 800-pound gorilla, and if the gorilla demands a banana, what do you give him? You give him a banana. That's, they're actually taught that in school. And so when he turns to the attorney and he says, uh, is that all right with you? I have never, ever heard anyone say to the judge, no, Your Honor, you can't do that. I won't let you do that or anything, or object anyway. No, they say, yeah, okay, by the time you get to that point. But what's the difference? In the first case, the judge is asking for authority. In the second case, he's being polite and being soft with the guy because I'm the king of the court, okay? Sovereign of the court. And all I have to do is say, I'm one of the people, and that covers it. 
Now, they don't necessarily understand what you're saying, so the, the very first time when I'm in court, all I do is if the judge does something, I say I object. He says, why do you object? I say, well, I really don't wish it that way. No, or I, I wish it to be some other way. Why do I say wish? Because when you're a king, my wish is his command. Okay, that's, that's centuries of tradition backing me up. So it sounds like I'm talking softly, but I'm not. That's an order when I say I wish. The judge in his initial ignorance will say, well, if that's the best thing you can do, you're overruled. I say, well, for the record, I do object. He says, all right, duly noted. You know. By the way, the word duly, what does that mean? I'll tell you because you don't know. Duly means D-U-L-Y. That word means that whatever it is satisfies the requirements of both the common law and the statutory law. Whenever you use that word duly, that's what you're saying. So be careful how you use the word duly. Don't use it unless you mean it. That's more legal language. Words will trap you. Okay. If you say something is duly, that opens the way for them to enforce the statutory law against you. Okay your own law against you, if you decree it. Anyway, so then all of my court sessions last about five minutes. Hardly ever go beyond five minutes. Why? Because I don't handle business in court. All the business is defined in the paperwork. Any questions, it's in the paperwork. That's it. And, then, and if they do something, I object. And we go through that scenario. And then after we object, we leave the courtroom. That's when I sit down and type up the orders vacating the judge's decision, if he dared to make one. OK? It's that efficient. This case that we have as an example is about five years old now. But don't let that fool you. It's five years old because we intended to produce a perfect case. We researched everything. And we let it stretch out so that we could do the job right. It's actually the case should have been resolved in 60 days. There are a few delays introduced. We could have resolved those faster, but we wanted a perfect example. We got the bonus of finding the judge in uh, contempt of court. We never expected to get to that level, but we did, so you got it. It's kind of fun. Okay, we fined him $1, by the way. He never paid it. Now, a lot of people tell me, ha, that proves it didn't work. Well, let me tell you something. You run around giving orders, you better be right. Because those judges are not shy. They'll throw you in jail for contempt of court. It's a misdemeanor to put out a, a paper purporting to be a court order. You betcha. And what really happened was he got in trouble. I mean, he was in trouble. That was a good contempt finding. And the presiding judge pulled him off of our case and 900 other cases. We could have, we could have glued him to the case if we chose to, but we chose not to. What happened was that they assigned a new judge. They assigned him to another court in Timbuktu, different part of the county, handling only uh, criminal cases. And the new judge, he seemed like an okay guy, but we looked up his background. We found out that this guy was their big can in our, on our case. He and some other judges loved the common law they had their own organization where that's all they do is study common law. They love it. it. He was a specialist in common law. In this case we had was a common law case. And on top of that, this guy, now this is a superior court case. This guy at one time was the presiding judge of the appellate department of the superior court in California. We had one of their sharpest men on the job here. But you know what? It made no difference. Why? Because he wasn't in charge. He couldn't make any decisions. You know, I like to tell people, partly because I'm mentally ill, I like to tell people that I am the world's foremost authority on how a guest should be treated and how a host should act when a guest is visiting a host in the host's home. Okay? You want to know anything about etiquette? Just ask me. I'm the self-appointed authority. I can tell you all about it. OK? Now, there is one little detail. When I go to visit you in your home, how much authority do I have? Somewhere close to zero, right? 
That's the problem the judge had. He was in my home. You see? So, anyway, going back to this, citizen of the United States means that you're a 14th Amendment citizen and you are subject to the jurisdiction. People are not subject to the jurisdiction. Only citizens of the United States are subject to the jurisdiction. Okay? If you're not subject to the jurisdiction, you can't be a citizen of the United States. Now, I've got another one for you. In addition to all that, did you know that you can be a citizen of the United States for some purposes and not a citizen for other purposes, and the choice is yours? You decide. That's why I have a Social Security number. That's why I plan to get uh, whatever retirement things they want to throw at me. That's fine. Because it's restricted to that specific contract. Okay? Unless there's some overt agreement on my part that I accept all those terms and it better be knowingly, intelligently, you know, all those conditions for a good contract, they're in trouble if they try to carry it beyond the basics. So you can be a citizen. Now, how, how is that possible? Well, here's what happened. Back in, um, well, we're in the wrong section here. We're, we're in the uh, people are citizen, which one are you section, okay? But let's go back to sovereignty, okay? And so here we quote this case again, the people of the state, you know, it's king's prerogative and all that. All right, now, uh, here in California, they have a section in the government code. Now, the government code is specifically written for them guys in government, okay? The government code is not written for you or me, although it makes interesting reading sometimes, as I'm about to show you. But it's written for them. It's to tell them what the score is. These are their job instructions, okay? So what does it say? Well, this is the beautiful one right here. You're going to love this. Check this out. The people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. Is there anything about that that you don't understand? <laughs> they don't understand. Yes, they do. But you have to put it in terms that they understand. That means a court order. Okay? You're just going to walk up to any old policeman and say, hey, you know, you don't have any authority over me. He'll demonstrate how a gun works. Okay? So you've got to use a little judgment here. But when you back it up, when you, and you'll see, when you go to read those court orders that are part of this CD, you'll see we lay down the logic, okay? Starting with the preamble, working all the way through, and we bring this out too. The people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. And I'll tell you something else. It's in there twice. See down here? Section, also the government code. So you have it in 11120 and you have it in 54950. They said it twice. One of the few places in the, in the codes where they said it twice and it's word for word the same. It's a very important concept. This is a republic. And because it's a republic, that has validity. So we don't yield our sovereignty. Well, what is a sovereign? I think we can get that now. Sovereignty, the power to do everything in a state without accountability. That's what a sovereign is. In other words, you make the law. There's no law above you. Moral law certainly is not law, not in the secular sense, okay? Understand that there is a limit. It doesn't mean that we're without law, okay? All some sovereign has to do is point his finger at you and say, you violated this rule I just made up. Okay, and then your only protection will be a jury. But, so, it is possible, you know, to do wrong and get punished for it. So don't, but it's a different system.